All right, you need to go to your modules. Um, however your teacher has your work organized, you need to find your iReady workbook pages. Go ahead and download them. They should pop up down here. Whoop. Click on it. And then what I would do is download it again and save it to your desktop. You can minimize this now and you should see it on your desktop somewhere. Open that up and here we go. If you open it this way you can um, go to the top. This is a pen, highlighter, all that stuff. If you want to go ahead and um, write your answers here that's great and you can turn it in that way. So I'm going to click my highlighting tool so you can stay with me as I read. Alright so we are analyzing the structure of stories. Stories are made of words. Duh. Authors build these words into sentences and paragraphs and if the story is really long, chapters. This is pretty obvious. What's less obvious is how these parts work together to develop a story's theme, setting, and plot. When you think about how a story's parts work together, you're thinking about a story's structure. So let's highlight structure because that's more important. I'm just using this yellow to, for you to see where I am so you can read along with me. One way to analyze a story structure is asking yourself this question. How does a specific sentence or chapter help develop this story? Obviously, it's a picture, so you need to look at more than just the words. We're going to look at the left one first, and then we'll look at the right one. So I'm just going to focus in on this one right here. So I've got a guy and a girl, the setting, they are in the forest. He says, we've been walking for hours. I think we're lost. So let's look right here on the left panel, which is this one. The setting is that the characters are in a forest. Obvious, okay? Now how does that contribute to the plot? The characters have been walking for hours. How do we know that? He said it. Okay, what else can we figure out? Okay, they've been walking for hours, but they're also, why would you be walking for hours? Not to get their exercise. They are lost. Okay, if you just click, that box should pop up. Then kind of hover over it till you see the hand and move that however you want. If you want to change the font size and things like that, you go here. I'm going to change mine to black and make it a little bigger. Okay. Alright, so now let's look over here. I'm going to go back to my highlighting tool. And let's look at the right side. Okay, so here we have the same forest, but let's read to see if we have um, kind of the same feel with this forest. So I think I broke my ankle. He's down here holding his ankle. Not looking too happy. It's not safe here. Do I leave him and go for help or do I stay with him until we're both found? So this is thoughts because you can see her little thinking bubbles and not a conversation bubble. So she's not saying that out loud. So let's look at the setting. The setting is, it's a forest, but it's not safe. She says, it's not safe here. Okay, so let's look at how this contributes to the plot. The boy has a broken ankle. We don't know what happened, but he has a broken ankle. So now let's look over here. What is she, how is she contributing to the plot? Okay, I think it's because she's conflicted and she's asking herself, oh no, do I leave him and go for help or do I stay with him until we're both found? She can't decide if she needs to go find somebody. Let's say she is conflicted at what to do. Go ahead and type and then you can move your box around. Alright, so our contribution to the theme is that the panels were taken together, suggests that the story's theme is about how people should act when they're in danger. Let's highlight that. Alright, so let's go on to the next pages. Okay, here we are on page 154. A Moose Encounter by Lucy Barrett. Jill quietly slipped out of the faded orange tint and into the cool fall air of, Minis of a Minnesota morning.
All right, so just this first sentence is telling me Jill is our main character. And the setting is what? Minnesota in the fall. Okay, these are things that you should be already looking at as you're reading. All right, so I'm going to keep going. Though the sun had just begun to rise, so it's obviously the morning, she could hear woodland creatures scurrying on the ground. Jill glanced back to make sure her father was still asleep inside. Hmm. He had told her not to wander around alone, but she had to see a moose. Okay, right here, that author made had italicized on purpose. So let's highlight, highlight it a different color because that is important. Oops. <clears throat> let's go back to my yellow. They had been making this camp trip for three years now, and though this was supposed to be a moose territory, they had yet to actually see one. Jill was determined to change that. So let's look down here. It says complete the chart below. It will help you analyze what each paragraph contributes to the story. So we read first the first paragraph. Let's do the first paragraph. Well, they've done it for you, so let's read it. How does it contribute to the setting? Well, obviously, first paragraphs always contribute to the setting. So it establishes the setting, and it's a fall morning in Minnesota. We've already determined that. If you wanted to go in and add that it's at a campsite, I think that would be pretty good. And that's too small, so I need to highlight that. Go up here, and let's change my... Change... Bear with me. What is happening? That's good enough. All right, so how does it contribute to the overall plot? So usually first paragraphs start the story, okay, and tells you your basic situation. The basic situation is that Jill wants to see a moose so badly that she disobeys her father to see one. How do you know that she's disobeying her father? What is it saying here? Okay, it says she glanced back to make sure her father was still asleep inside. She's sneaking out, okay? So this is just getting us a base. All right, let's continue with paragraph two. Moving swiftly, so she's going quick, Jill eventually found herself at a river. Ooh, that should go ding, 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 ding. My setting has changed. She decided to wait, hoping that a moose might come and drink. A short time later, Jill saw a brown animal in the distance, and she held her breath at the creature as the creature approached. It was a moose calf. Grinning broadly, Jill began walking towards it, but before she could get very far, a giant female moose appeared out of nowhere and came charging towards her. Again, really good vocabulary that the author used. Charging. Okay, that's going to make you feel some type of way and not a good way. So let's make that blue. Charging. I like words like that. Giant. Swiftly. All right, so let's go ahead and fill out our box for paragraph two. <clears throat> How does the second paragraph contribute to the setting? Well, we've already said that it has changed... Now Jill is at a river. Before they started off at the tent, now they are at a river. And then how does this paragraph contribute to the plot? Well, first it was just saying she wants to see a moose. Well, guess what? She's, she's seen the moose, but she saw something more than she wanted to see. Jill... Once I get what she wants to see a moose. Let's move this over a little bit. Okay, but it's more than that she gets to see a moose. What's the problem now? We've gotten into a little bit of a, a problem, but let's make this a compound sentence. But 
she also sees a female moose charging towards her. Okay, we can always use that, not copying, but we can use some of the vocabulary from the passage. Okay, so let's continue on to our other paragraphs. We have three more paragraphs here. So this is paragraphs three, four, and five. Um, so continue reading. Petrified, Jill could only stare as the animal galloped closer and closer. Again, love this word petrified. She knew the worst place to be was between a mother, animal, and her young, especially an animal as massive as a moose. Okay? So again, we have totally changed our mood from over here. She was determined, she was excited, and now we are petrified. Okay, let's go on to the next paragraph. Suddenly, again, I like this, this word. Jill felt herself being yanked out of the moose's path, and she held on tightly as her father pulled her behind some trees to hide from the moose's view. They watched as the mother became distracted by her calf, and Jill sighed in relief. All right, so now this is where we have a big change in our story. Um, Jill, for a second there at the beginning, we thought she was going to maybe potentially get hurt by this mother moose, but who came out? Her father. Her father came and saved her. Again, do we have any changes with our setting? No, our setting is the same. Let's keep going. Later, when she finally returned to safety, this, to the safety of the campsite, Jill was full of apologies. So now she is changing the way she's thinking. I learned my lesson. She vowed to her father. No more moose encounters for me. Here we have a change in setting. They're back at the campsite. This story kind of goes full circle to where we started. Okay, so we need to look at our question here. Circle the correct answer. Which statement best describes the role the second paragraph on this page plays in the story's plot? I always tell my students they need to highlight keywords. So here, let's read this question and highlight the keywords. Which statement best describes the role the second paragraph, so that's what we're looking at, on this page plays in the story's plot? So how does the second paragraph contribute to the story's plot? That's not the second paragraph over here. It says on this page. That's pretty important too. So it's not this paragraph, but this paragraph. So we're looking right here. Let's go through our answer choices and eliminate ones that we know are wrong. So it details the story's turning point when Jill's father scolds her. So I would say this is pretty close to the turning point. Um, you could kind of argue between these two paragraphs. But is Jill's father scolding her? No. Okay, so that would make A wrong. He's not scolding her. B. It prevents a new problem that Jill and her father must face. Well, she already had a problem here and at the end of the second paragraph. And it's not like her and her father are together trying to face this problem. She doesn't even know he's there. He just eventually saves her. So I don't think B is the right answer. C. It shows that Jill has learned to always listen to her father. Well, this paragraph, she hasn't learned. This paragraph, yes, I've learned my lesson. But if you look here, and that's why we highlighted this second paragraph, because if you overlooked that, you could think any of these were right. So no. Let's look at D. It explains how Jill's father saves her and sets up the resolution. Well, yes, he saved her by yanking her out of the path. And that's when she has a sigh of relief. And we're setting up the resolution. You usually have a resolution at the end of the story. So we'll say that D is the correct answer. And circle it. Because it explains how her father saved her, like we said. He yanked her out of the way. And then it sets it up for the resolution, which is always at the end. And getting fancy with my arrows. Lastly, we want to show our thinking. So we're explaining our answer. Why is the second paragraph of this page necessary to the story? So 
highlighting our keywords, second paragraph on this page, necessary to the story, meaning how does it contribute to the story. You always start your open-ended response by restating the question. So let's say the second paragraph is necessary to the story because it shows how Jill was saved from the female moose's path. Okay, that protected her from danger. Her father yanked, and just make another box down here, her from harm's way and this eventually led Jill to learn her lesson as a resolution. Okay, so that is the moral of the story. That is your theme. She has learned her lesson.